So, last month, Gundam Requiem for Vengeance got released, and it really wasn't that great. It's all around been considered pretty mid by both Gundam fans and critics. I did do my initial thoughts about the show in a live stream, but it's hardly as collected as my scripted videos, so I figured I'd do a follow-up. This particular show just came across as awkward, like the creators of it were kind of fumbling around in the dark. To be truthful, when you look up the people who worked on it, you see why. Nobody on the show really had much experience, and at points it really does feel like amateur hour. One compliment I will pay to this show, though, is this. It tried to be a Gundam show in tone and candor, which is more than I can say for Witch from Mercury and the most recent Gundam Seed movie. Heck, watching it, I can tell the creator does care about this franchise. He's obviously a Gundam fan, and he was giving it his best shot. So, if you are the creator of this show, the director, I forget your name, and you do stumble across this video, just take what I'm saying as criticism. I do understand you gave it your best. He just fell short in this. Now, I think it goes without saying that I know quite a bit about Gundam's One Year War. I did four videos on it that later got turned into a compilation talking about where all the One Year War stories fit into the overall timeline, plus all the reviews I did of media that fits into that war, and I managed to show everybody what was happening where pretty well, I think. So having a Xeon story where a Gundam gets involved would not be easy to fit in, and they did try to give it a shot, but there's some problems with it. What they do that works is they have the story take place in Romania, which actually didn't have any Gundam stories taking place in that part of Europe. Well, not really. The problem is the time frame. The story starts literally one day before Operation Odessa begins, and you have Xeon troops not knowing what a Gundam or a gym is. You also have the idea of our main squadron, who, by the way, they do have a makeup of their paint jobs that is an obvious homage to the red shoulders from Armored Trooper Vodoms, so thumbs up there, but they're apparently heroes of the Battle of Loom. I have a problem with that because we've kind of known all the heroes of the Battle of Loom for, like, decades. So I feel like trying to throw them in, really, mm, not something I would have done. Personally, and this is just me, I would have much rather had them do something like having them be a key factor at Operation British, maybe say that they did some sort of an operation with a well-known character like maybe Anna Velgato. Be a nice little tie-in. That's just my thought. I think it would have worked a lot better, but that's, that's me. But anyway, the idea of the cast not knowing what a Gundam or Jim's were just doesn't fit in November of UC-0079. Gundams and Jims have already been deployed in several theaters at this point. Hell, by November of 0079, Amuro and the White Base have already traveled across America and are actually attacking Makuve's positions at this point in southern Europe, which isn't that far from where this story takes place. The idea that these folks just don't know that the Federation has mobile suits or what a Gundam is is just silly. It was already a legend at this point. Just as a side note, hey Bandai, I'm for hire. If you need someone to edit these things to make sure that UC lore is working out, just shoot me an email. I promise I won't overcharge for my services. I'm already editing comic books, which you can buy on Indiegogo, like Cyberpop, my collaboration with the Almighty Lolly, or Black Rhapsody Book 2, where I'm also editing that one, and you can get on the mailing list for it. Link in the description. Okay, enough of me being a whore. Back to the robots. Now, the way that the rest of the plot plays out is largely inoffensive, but the characterization is really light here. I talked about the concept of maximizing your minutes when I was doing my Helsing review, which means adding small, defining character moments that speak volumes. And I feel the need to show this anime as an example of a story that doesn't do that. Characters that I'd like to know spend way too much fucking time spewing Xeon propaganda that makes me just tune them out. The only interesting Xeon characters are the main character, Iria Solari, who has a great Gundam name, by the way, and the base colonel, whose name escapes me at the moment. Though, admittedly, it is cool to see Yuri Kellern from the 08th MS team make a cameo, so thumbs up for that. But anyway, the reason that we get to know Iria Solari as a character is because she's the only one not spewing Gear and Zabi talking points. She's someone who fights because it's her job, and she just wants to get back to her kid. She's already lost her husband, who, like her, was a musician. Her job is just to beat the enemy and make sure that people make it home safe. It's not the most original character arc ever, 
but it is one that is identifiable, largely because she's essentially a female parallel to Richard Winters in Band of Brothers, down to the two of them having the same hair color. I don't know if that's actually what the writer had in mind, but that's how it comes across. As it stands, the lack of interesting character moments for the rest of the cast really makes the story feel very bland. The other thing that bothers me about the show that's a huge negative is another lore blunder, oddly enough, that some commenter brought up. This is probably one of the dumbest comments that I've seen on my One Year War videos, and you can tell it's a Xeon apologist. Since around these parts we say Zeke with a hard R, I'm going to read his comment in a voice that sounds like I think he sounds. It's strange to see how your video is 100% pro federation when they soothe child foliers, they outnumber the Xeon and still use child soldiers, have better tech and still use child soldiers. Notice how he only knew how to spell soldiers like on the third try. Jesus Christ, kid. Anyway, while Xeon committed a genocide, only one, like some tool of in our world, they are deemed the bad guys. From what I hear, Gundam is anti-war, but it seemed totally lost on those four videos. Couple things. First, we don't need your unsolicited opinions on Israel because you're obviously referencing that. Comes across like you watch Hassan Piker. Don't watch Hassan Piker, kids. Don't do that to yourself. It's bad for brain development. You know, it's kind of obvious that this little Zeke sympathizer is a prime example of why modern education systems need a serious overhaul, and he also came into watching my Gundam vid after watching Requiem for Vengeance. We're going to get into spoilers here, so I'm assuming that you've seen the show if you're reaching this point of the video, or you didn't really have much of an interest in it. But either way, there are spoilers ahead, so if you do want to watch Requiem for Vengeance, now is the time to do it and then just come back to this point in the vid. We'll go ahead and put the spoiler tag up, though. So the final battle of the show is our lead character having to delay the Gundam so that Xeon FLEs could take off and her people could possibly go home to the colonies. It's similar to other things that we've seen, like in MS Igloo, or in the 08 MS team's last episodes, or when the White Dingo faced off against Vish Donahue in their final battle. Now, before this fight happened, the main character's team tried to steal some gems and failed, but she managed to meet the Gundam pilot and was shocked that it was a kid and a fellow new type. Yeah, the lead character's a new type, but that's kind of expected. The final battle between the two is basically your standard Gundam fare when two new types fight one another, with one trying to get the other to stand down because they don't really need to kill one another. This particular fight, along with a lot of the fights in this show, which is something I should have complimented earlier, the fights are good in this, but this particular fight was really good because we're still following the one character with actual character development. We know why she doesn't want to fight to the death here, but the fight has a great desperation to it because there is something that both sides are fighting for. The first thing on her mind is that she wants to see her people go home, and the second is that because she's a mom herself, she likely doesn't want to send a child home in a box when that doesn't need to happen. It's a really tense fight. And the end of the fight is actually pretty brilliant because it encapsulates some of the best Gundam stories in one moment. And that feeling that they invoke when you watch something like Gundam Victory or Zeta Gundam or the ending of Double Zeta, so on and so forth. The battle ends when the kid in the Gundam finally realizes that his opponent is right. The fight is over, one of the FLVs is gone, the other one got shot down, there's no point in killing more people. The kid even goes so far as to actually save Iria's life from falling debris. It is a really wholesome moment. It's very uplifting. It's very heartwarming. And even though I hadn't really liked this show up to this point, this last episode was slapping hard in a great way up until that moment. And then the next thing that happened was as Gundam as Gundam gets. Because when we get a little bit of a hope spot, tragedy strikes. <laughs> This moment right here encapsulates Gundam in a nutshell. This is the horrors of war. The fight was over. It was done. We got a moment of peace where it seemed like healing could happen between the two sides. Maybe there's hope for the future. And then somebody sneak attacks the Gundam. It's over, ended quickly and brutally. Hope, understanding, and a better tomorrow are snuffed out by one sword strike from a goof custom. A kid just fucking died brutally, and the only person that cares is Iria. 
If this had been the ending of Requiem for Vengeance, it would have been the perfect ending for a Gundam show. The problem is, is that the director thought that this was Return of the King, and that it shouldn't end at the logical closure point. Let me tell you something. If Peter Jackson really wanted to blow me away with those Rings movies, he would have ended the third one on the logical closure point, not the 25 endings that followed. What's the logical closure point? Yeah, friend, enlighten us. When fucking Frito wakes up from his little coma or whatever and the little hobbits are jumping up and down on his bed and Sam leans in the doorway and gives him that very fucking gay look. The actual ending has the lead character talking about going to Africa and continuing to fight the Federation because they use child soldiers, which is a stupid thing to say because Zeon uses child soldiers too. How the fuck do you think Monique Cadillac's kid brother got killed? How many Zeon soldiers, quote unquote, that were fucking children were crying for their mom at the Battle of Abawaku? What the fuck do you think Elpeo Puru and all of her clones are? Hell, just look at the life that Mari de Cruz had for being one of those goddamn clones. Folks, the Federation is full of corrupt people. Not only is that true, in the Zeon is exhausted speech from General Revel, he says as much. They do screwed up shit. I mean, just look at the story in Missing Link and the whole story behind the exam system that shows up in Blue Destiny. There's some messed up stuff that the Federation does and takes part in. The thing is, Zeon does all of that and more! And we have a Zeon soldier lecturing the audience on the Federation's evils? Dude, this is tone deaf. Had the story ended with the Gundam pilot's death and just went straight to the credits after everyone walks away from the corpse, that ending would have been so much more impactful. But no, because this is modern media, you need to try and beat the audience over the head with a half-baked message that rings completely hollow because the faction that this person is part of has destroyed giant chunks of the Earth and slaughtered billions of people, including a good chunk of fellow space noids. So yeah, this show ended up falling flat on its face, and it sucks, because I'd have totally been down for another solid one-year war story. Nope, no such luck. Well, folks, if you enjoyed my breakdown of the show's problems and want to support my work, please go back Cyberpop and get on the Black Rhapsody mailing list. Plus, let's keep the subscriber train going. Our next big subscriber goal for me to do something wild is 50,000 subscribers, but we need your help to get there. So go hit the button. My name is Micah Curtis. I will see you all next time.